it's not really fun. Where does one start when it comes to the journey of the Qur'an? Um, SubhanAllah, I, you know, when I think about my journey through the Qur'an, I think about my mom. Uh, you know, she, she provided for me or paved the way for me something that she herself did not have. And she would drive me to all the different Qur'an you know, classes in Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. And, uh, okay. And, uh, you know, her dua and her, you know, sleepless nights, hoping I make it through my teenage years um, in a non-rebellious fashion. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, not because of her, but because of me. And, um, I think it was really the the moment that I was able to go to Syria at the age of 13 and be around people that their hearts are connected to Allah and they gave the Quran with all their souls and I, I felt that and I didn't even know what Tajweed was I had never heard that word until I was 15 and they said, you're going you're gonna to learn Tajweed. I said, Tajweed, taj what? I actually didn't even know what it was. And I said, okay. So they paired me up with a teacher, and um, I don't even remember how it happened, but I fell in love with it. And I felt like this is how the Qur'an is supposed to sound. This is how it was given to us in the dunya. And if you think about it, the Qur'an is the only speech on this earth that's not from here. And it's Allah's words. And what I learned about the Qur'an is that it's a journey that carries you through your life. It's something that you don't just start and leave, but it's something that you start and hopefully, inshallah, we take with us to our graves. And I truly, truly believe from my heart that without the Qur'an, there's zero happiness. And that's, that's just from my own personal experience in life. And any trials or tribulations that anybody is going through, if you have the Qur'an with you, it will carry you through that. It's like being in a ship, and the Qur'an is just riding you through that storm. And the dunya is a storm. It's not supposed to be a place of comfort or ease. So we're just passing through it. And if we have the Qur'an with us as that guide and companion, then inshallah, we'll never feel sadness. It's impossible. Especially if we try to internalize the Qur'an and hopefully live by it, inshallah. Um, so it's a lifelong journey. And uh, I would just say three things that my teachers instilled in me and that I try to practice myself and hopefully inshallah if I can possibly give that as advice. The first is to make the intention. Make the intention with the Quran no matter how lofty it is. And start small. Don't don't assume that you can't do it. The Quran is not for Arab, it's for everybody. The Quran is not for young people. It's for everybody. And I've seen countless stories where people of all ages have been able to memorize the Qur'an, live by it, and take it as their companion throughout their lives. So intention. The second thing is to always come with a clean heart. So a, a lot of the different talks that you've heard tonight, as well as in other nights, have emphasized the importance of purification of the heart. And I know that here, mashallah, in this community, there are many talks that are given about that. It's that important. If we don't refine our hearts and work on our hearts constantly, the Qur'an will have no space in our heart. We can't have both. We can't have sinning and the Qur'an together in our hearts. We have to make room for the Qur'an and for Allah. And then the third thing is dua. Ask Allah for ease. The Qur'an is a roller coaster ride. It's not going to all be easy. There are going to be times where 
it's going to be challenging and you're going to want to throw in the towel, but don't. And just keep making dua to Allah that he grants you openings and tawfiq. And inshallah, we can all take the Quran as our companion for our entire lives so that inshallah, it can be our companion in our graves and it can be a light for us. And so that we can inshallah pass that down generationally in our families and in our communities, inshallah. Allah barik fiki. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. I'm going to start crying. I know I am. <laughs> Try really hard to get through this. Alhamdulillah. Like Suzanne said, mashallah, where do you start in the conversation of Qur'an? And as our dear aunt said, so since shared, she asked me to talk a little bit about the journey, the journey of getting to this point. And for me, it starts uh, far ago, long ago, but it, we'll start from where you started from too, where I met you, mashallah. I had grown up on the East Coast, and when I was about 13 or so, I moved to Michigan, to the same community where Hafid Suzanne had grown up. And it was in that community, I want to share with you, you'll hear from me, a series of different women who their, <laughs> their dedication to the Qur'an and to Islam and to the Dawah is actually what allowed for the door and the path for so many of us girls to be able to study the Qur'an. When I got to Michigan, I had some foundation in Arabic and in the Qur'an, but I wasn't quite at the level <laughs> of the girls that had been in this community, mashallah, that had been studying Arabic and Qur'an for some time with women, mashallah, who had been really dedicated to teaching the girls of the community. And so the first summer I arrived there, I was about, I guess, 13, I imagine. And I attended a summer camp, and I thought, oh, this is nice. And at the end of the summer, all these girls came back from Syria. And they were talking about, there was this buzz and excitement that they all had received an ijaza. And I thought, what's, just kind of like you, what's an ijaza? What's that word even mean? And there was all this excitement, and they said, oh, they finished reading the Qur'an, or they finished memorizing the Qur'an. And I, they had a ceremony for them. And in this beautiful ceremony, they crowned them. And they caped them. And they honored them with the Qur'an. And I remember being this little girl going, wow, I want to do that. And that's why I wanted your daughters here tonight. Because you don't know, subhanAllah, when you see something like that and you feel like it could be possible, you don't know when that's going to enter your heart, subhanAllah. But it seemed really far because I wasn't Syrian. And I didn't know how to get to Syria like the rest of the girls. <laughs> and I didn't have the kind of very strong foundation they did. And I'm going to share these things with you because for anyone who says the Qur'an isn't for me or for my daughter, or I don't know and I'm not a native Arabic speaker and I'm not sure I can do this, the Qur'an is a miracle. And the ability to read Qur'an and to memorize the Qur'an even by non-native Arabic speakers and sometimes not even fully understanding it is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the story goes, and there's many women, as I mentioned, and I have to I feel indebted to really share their names tonight, subhanAllah. So in brief, the first one I want to share is when I was in that first year in Michigan, there was a sheikha who had come to Michigan to visit. We didn't know at the time, subhanAllah, that she was actually there for medical treatment, that she was ill. All we knew was there was all this excitement that there was the sheikha from Syria who was visiting Michigan and all the women were attending classes with her for the period of time that she was there. And her name was Ansa Dalal. And then one day she said, call the girls of the community over. I want to meet them. And so all of us girls went into this house and we all kind of sat there in a halaqa. And I can't even tell you exactly what she was talking about. All I know is that I was in tears the entire <laughs> class. And I went home that night and I said to my parents, wherever she's from, please send me there. I thought what happened is I told my parents that night, I want to go to Syria. And they said the Muslim parent thing, inshallah. <laughs> SubhanAllah, the backstory where the teachers of our community, Ansa Wafa, and Ansa Jumana, Khala Zainab, and I'm naming them SubhanAllah because there's so many women who are part of this story in the background, who apparently for that entire year went to my parents and kept knocking on their door and saying, we want Rania to go to Syria. And my parents are like, inshallah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they couldn't fathom sending me as a young girl to a country they're not from and by myself and how. Long story short, Allah will, alhamdulillah, that I would get there that summer of my 14th year. And I was ecstatic. I was so excited to be there. And I wanted to do the Qur'an thing that all the girls were doing. But I shared with you that when I got there, I was still kind of... I want to be very honest and somewhat vulnerable in these discussions because it's very true, the story of how, subhanAllah, it doesn't matter. And I'll tell you, and I don't know where did Ustada Fadwa go, but anyhow, she had a picture she was going to show you. But there was a, <laughs> we went that first summer, and it was one summer, and all the girls were studying, and the very first thing their teachers did to us is they handed us a mushaf. And they said, if you want to unlock Islam, and you want to work in da'wah, and you want to understand Islam, the key is the Qur'an. Without it, you can't do anything. And the first thing they would hand us is the Qur'an and say, start here and we'll fill in all the other classes short, but the Qur'an first. And so in all the breaks and in all the classes, the Qur'an is going on in the background, all the girls are studying. That summer, many of the girls finished their ijazah. We all came back from the summer break. I hadn't. And I share this with you because sometimes you pray for something deeply and you want something intensely. <laughs> Forgive me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the time and the place and when it's meant to be. And sometimes when the dua doesn't seem like it's being answered, it's because you're not ready yet. Allah either wants you to have a more sincere intention than the one you've had, or you need more purification, or you simply need more time and he knows you need to bake a little bit longer. Thank you. Inshallah. <laughs> Allah ibadik fiki. And so, inshallah, if we come back and the, the picture that I have for you is my 14-year-old self standing with the other girls in their crowns and I'm hugging them, so excited for them, just beaming, <laughs> inshallah. And in Arabic, subhanAllah, Arabic is such a beautiful language because we have words like ripta, which is positive, good jealousy, not bad jealousy. The kind where you're so happy for everyone else. You want what they have, but you don't want it to t be taken away from them. This is good jealousy. That's what you would see in that picture, subhanAllah. And I kept praying to Allah. And I kept saying to my parents, please send me back. And they said, oh, <laughs> one summer is enough. <laughs> you're not serious. What are you doing there? One's enough. I tried my 15th year that summer. They said no. I tried my 16th year. They said no. I tried when my 17th year. And they said to me, they had this deal, they said, Rania, here's what you have to do. You graduate at the top of your class with a 4.0, with scholarships to college, <laughs> and we'll send you back to Syria. They thought all these barriers. <laughs> and so for the longest time, my joke had been when people would say, how did you get into medical school? I would say, trying to get to Syria. <laughs> <laughs> That's a barakallah. My 17th year, I came to them and I said, I've done everything you've asked. Please send me back. And they finally did. And on that trip, alhamdulillah, I received my first ijazah in the Qur'an, in the Qira'ah of Hafs, alhamdulillah. Now, you all, sisters, are part of the next part of the story. Because it was soon after that I would actually come to my first trip to California. Now, we knew Shafi's, like myself, and Hanafi's. I had never met a Maliki sister. And so when I got to California, <laughs> I said, Malikis? <laughs> What's this all about? Mashallah. And the sisters knew that I was teaching Qur'an, Tajweed, and they would say, come teach us. But the Maliki sisters would say, but we want to learn Qira'at Warsh. And I said, Warsh? <laughs> and so on the next trip back to Syria, I told another, see, more women, mashallah, part of the story, An Sa'afaf this time, another teacher. And I said to her, the Maliki sisters are asking for qira at warsh. And she said, well, we don't, we don't, we only give ijazah in hafs, and then the next one after that, you got to do all ten. 
And I said, all ten? <laughs> it took me so many years to do the one, <laughs> mashallah. They all ten, she said, well, we'll ask the sheikh. This is not customary. And they went ahead and they asked the sheikh. And they said, there's this <laughs> girl from America <laughs> who's going to California. And over there, they need qira'at at warish. And the sheikh said, yes. Can you imagine? Subhanallah. They had, he hadn't issued like a single ijazah of warish like that hadaran before. And so I worked on that ijazah and mashallah came here. And I didn't know this at the time that I'd end up moving here, getting married here, uh, marrying somebody who was a, <laughs> a Maliki <laughs> sheikh. Mashallah. <laughs> Shatabarakallah. And that my children would probably one day be Maliki. Subhanallah. Anyhow, alhamdulillah. Long story short, when I got here, before uh, the day I received my ijazah in Warish, I re my teacher, Ansafaf, one of the Ansat, she gave me this. This is one volume of six. Right? And it was hot off the press. And she handed me this big, big thing. <laughs> and she said, I want you to have this. And I said, What's this? And she said, This is called Al Bast Fil Qura'at Al Ashar. It's a book published by a sheikha called Samar Al Asha. You, I, just a moment, I have to tell you about her. MashaAllah. To know that people like this walk today, to our, are here in our existence amongst the scholars today of women, SubhanAllah. She had written a book where she took all ten canonical recitations of the Qur'an and put them side by side, the entire Mus'haf. Now, Ansa Samar, when Syria was before the war, she was also the head of the Hadith school for women. And she had also written a book. She's also a muhaditha, as in to say, all the hadith books she had memorized. And she had written a book in how do you memorize those ahadith with their narrations. Tatabarakallah. Yani, you can't find books like this even in classical tradition. Long story short, this the book, the, her, her most recent book was this one, on the Ashar Qiraat. And Ansafaf handed it to me like the whole six volumes. And she said, here, and I said, what am I going to do with this? And she said, one day, one day you'll study it. Now, the story takes place, I was in medical school. And if you know anything about medical school, it's medical school and residency and fellowship and then faculty. And in the meantime, I was married and one child, second child, and another child. <laughs> this book stayed on the shelf for years. Every year, I would look at it. And I would feel the sense of, like really wanting it, like show, like really wanting it, and a sense of guilt at the same time. And then this is where, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give you something immediately and you keep praying for it, you can't stop making dua for it. And I would say, Ya Allah, I'm so, I feel so honored and blessed for what you've given me, family, career, etc. But I really want this. Where is the time for this? Where will it come? And our teachers would say that if you really want something, but you're not willing to get up for tahajjud to, to pray for it, then do you really want it at all? And so we would pray and pray and pray. And he won't believe how the dua was answered. He won't believe how this dua was answered. I heard of a group of people who were going to be working on the Ashur Qira'at remotely. And I thought, SubhanAllah, this might work with the schedule. And... <laughs> They said, send in a recording. And I'm going to be very honest and transparent. And if it was the other Salima Stawan, she's going to wonder why I'm even sharing this story. But just so you know, they, she said, send in a recording. So I sent in a recording. They said, it's for people who already have ijaz and tajweed to work on the Ashar Qiraat. When I sent in my recording, she said, you needed a little bit of work. <laughs> and I knew that because it had been years since I had had the opportunity to really sit and study and teach tajweed. And so I thought, alhamdulillah, maybe it's not really quite the time. But that's not the answer. The answer is keep making dua. Weeks passed, and out of the blue, literally out of the blue, she messages me and she says, so did you finish your brushing up of the <laughs> And I thought, wait, was that an option? <laughs> what? <laughs> and so she said, come on, we're going to start in just three weeks. I said, three weeks? I'm going to do all of it, inshallah. And so Ustada Nawar, Talib Ava, one of our locals and beautiful souls, mashallah, said, I said to her, can I read to you? And like Ustada Simon said, if somebody says, can I read to you? She just made the time. She said, you're ready? Send in your recording. And I did. Ustada Simon said, you're ready to join the cohort. 
Let me tell you something. My family looked at me, and I looked at them. <laughs> I said, I got accepted to do the Ashar Qara'at. And they just looked at me like, <laughs> we don't know how and where you're going to do this. And when someone takes on Qur'an, I just want to tell you, it's a family affair. The whole family sacrifices. The whole family works. Because there's time and energy and effort and studying, you take time. You borrow literally time, family time. But where was the time? You know how the du'a got answered? The story that I'm telling you is taking place in, June, in January and February of 2020. <laughs> At this point in my life, I'm at Stanford, I'm driving to Zaytun at Berkeley, I'm driving to San Jose for a clinic, I'm driving another day to Mountain View to another clinic, I'm driving to Pleasanton for halakas, I'm driving to Union City for another clinic. This was my week. Commute, 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 commute. You know how the du'at was answered? COVID. Oh. All of those commutes, like that, went away. And suddenly, <laughs> The hours of commutes went to Qur'an. I can't even explain it. It's been three years, and that was how the du'a was answered. So, I'm sorry, I took a lot of time. I just want to share in closing this, subhanAllah. The lesson learned here, like your three lessons, thank you so much, they're so beautiful, subhanAllah. It's physical health, emotional health, spiritual health. Just like we say to people, you need to stay physically healthy, Sisters, you and I know the gym isn't going to come to us. <laughs> Even the bicycle or the treadmill you have in your home, it's not going to come to you. <laughs> you have to carve out the time for it, subhanAllah. Mental health, you see the banner from Madison here. Wallahi, if we need the help, it's not going to just land in our laps. We have to make the effort and actually ask the people of knowledge of our time to help us, subhanAllah. Spiritual health. Dedicating ourselves to Islam and to the deen and the Qur'an doesn't happen on its own. Time is carved out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take the first step, right? Tie your camel. Tie your camel and I will do the rest. And that is the story of the Qur'an. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Please keep me in your du'as. Please give this. I feel like this is just the first step of a long, long, continuous journey. SubhanAllah, we have a long road ahead of us. But like Asa Sosin said, once one person starts, the whole community falls in suit. And I pray that inshallah we'll find from here a whole community of women who do this. Barakallahu feekum.
سمعت 